All right, all right. Long time no talk. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> For real. But that's why I, I also think that it's super important to have that push to talk thing. Like it's not really meetings that we're having. We're just like, you know, jumping into different rooms or, or, or something. Okay, let me ping the surge. All right, he's joining. Hey, hey. Hi, guys, how are you? Great. We're super excited to have this call with you. Absolutely. Nice to meet you, Maya and Sean. Hi. Nice to meet you, too. Nice to Thank meet you. you. So I. I think maybe we can do like quick intros just for Serge uh, to get acquainted. He, he was, you know, on and off from our Slack, which is super overwhelming, but yeah. So he knows who I am. I think he knows who Maya is, right? Yeah. Well, I certainly seen that name in the, you know, timelines <laughs> and uh, Slack and everything. So All right. I'm, so yeah, maybe not... quick intros for everyone would be helpful. Daniel, you want to start? Um, sure. So, um, depending on, on how we want to slice that. So I'm, I'm from, from Vancouver, BC, where I'm, my, my wheelhouse is virtual reality for positive social impact. And within uh, Corona Y, the other piece that I do is a lot of, of facilitation and governance stuff. So a lot of what I'm doing in Corona Y is simply leaping around and looking at how do we do our organization and, and flinging stuff in and seeing what sticks as far as that goes. Got it. Thank you, Daniel. Sean? Hey, yeah, um, I'm Sean McCaffrey. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and what I'm trying to do right now is package up what we have done already so that we can present it and propagate it to the medical community and uh, policymakers, as well as start looking at other submissions on Kaggle to seeing how we can get them from people who don't even know what Kaggle is into their hands. Wow, sounds good. Hey. Yeah. Um, I basically uh, lead the uh, ta uh, risk task team. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, besides that, uh, I, I kind of um, uh, try to see the bigger picture and understand where it can we be, let's say, in the six months, you know, or this kind in the six months from now, in a year from now. And uh, uh, kind of trying to understand what can be the uh, major impact, not just uh, let's say the Kaggle submissions, but like overall, what, what, how can we do the world better? That's kind of you know the stream of my so. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> so far, big picture guys and Slava, uh, you want to introduce yourself? That's the detail oriented, the actual infrastructure person. Yes. So um, I'm Slava and I'm originally from Kiev, from Ukraine, but uh, I live in in Netherlands for almost 10 years. So I've got also Dutch citizenship and I'm doing all uh, crazy stuff in European projects. Uh, I was involved in like 12 projects last years, really big projects. Some of them more than 1 billion euro uh, funding, so uh, I'm I'm doing all these infrastructural stuff for Corona Y. So Daniel, when you mentioned the projects, which uh, you mean like some kind of like uh, R and D projects uh, or? Yeah, I'm from research and innovation. Okay, I'm so... actually somewhere in the middle. I can put all the stuff that produced by research and development into production. So you're working for pharma companies, basically, right? I mean, uh, I'm working for the state, for Dutch state. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Serge. I'm an epidemiologist. Uh, we have still Alex and Anton. Oh, all right. yeah. Alex. <laughs> I, I don't yeah. see, sorry, I don't see all the people here. That's uh, all right. Yeah. No, it's, it's, <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm Alex uh, from London, kind of. Um, I'm a data scientist, actually, data science leads in a computer vision startup 
Um, but we also do NLP, so it's kind of a mix of ML and, and then engineering. So kind of the whole shenanigans, R&D, and then putting it into production. Um, yeah, I've joined the team like, I think a month ago, uh, and now kind of joined this newly forming team that's working on a, a quote unquote search engine, though it's, it's, it's got to be something. Yeah, something like that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me in a nutshell, I guess. Got it. Thank you, guys. Hello, I'm Anton. I'm also from Ukraine. And uh, like, I live in the United States now, particularly in the Bay Area. So I, I first came to the United States as a, like for PhD. So uh, uh, my background in academia is applied math, transition to computer science. And my computer science was in the field of bioinformatics. So I worked with like biologists, so cross-team collaboration type of environment. I graduated 2014 and then I jumped into like startup world because like I was studying in UC Riverside. So I was already in California. So kind of like Bay Area was very close by. So I ended up here. Uh, within Corona Y, I'm doing something kind of like if, if Slava is right now like bare bones infrastructure helping us, I'm kind of in between what Slava is doing and like the rest of the team. So kind of like the technical janitor just trying to like look around, see what's wrong, and then trying to figure out how to clean it up quickly and find those like proper rails, like path forward in terms of how we execute things. Got That's it. About it. Sounds great. Thank you. That's it. We're in. All right. And my name is Serge. I'm an epidemiologist and public health professional currently working in pharmaceuticals in consulting. So uh, I kind of know like both sides of the game in terms of uh, public health and uh, and the private sector aspects of uh, this business. So I, I hope that I can help you guys with some uh, product management aspects. Uh, I, I reviewed what you have done so far. It's fabulous. I mean, like the Kaggle submissions and everything, uh, especially the, I, I mean, I was kind of astonished by that uh, tool that is working with the drugs and stuff like that. So I, I didn't really catch the whole idea yet, but it, it looks cool. So uh, I, I guess we want to discuss the potential um, use cases for this, for this product. And, and maybe, maybe you wanna share like your, your vision of the future, where you wanna concentrate your efforts uh, among all those different things or it's going to be combined product eventually, or it's going to be like several uh, pieces to it. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a quick intro and then I talk too much. So I'll, I'll let other people talk. But basically the idea is that we want to create this discovery engine. And until uh, today we use the word search engine because that was the closest analogy. But in reality, we want to create a tool for researcher to not just find exactly what he knows what to find, but find something that he doesn't know exists, but should be aware of. And that's pretty much what we've done throughout these notebooks, kind of you know, extracting some information from data and creating some knowledge um, just from you know, th the presence of that data. So that's the, the, the notion of the future that I think we were determined to create. I think, I think one of the things that's also true with how we're approaching all of it is we're really responsive to the experts like you who know what's needed. And so the more we understand like what's, what's, what's the product or products that would be useful to you in your work, um, then, then we're, we're able to, to, to pivot and add and modify. Yeah. Wow, sounds great. So let me give you one example. We, we discussed this stuff with Maria before, and I think we were talking about you know, the discovery engine aspects as well. But I think um, we came up to the idea that, you know, may maybe in the future it will be possible to not only, uh, let's say, uh, facilitate the discovery process for, for the researchers, but kind of like basically help them to uh, structure and, you know, stockpile the research product itself. So, and we can start with, with stuff like uh, literature review, like introduction to the research which probably can be done automatically, mostly automated by your, uh, you know, technical tools. Um, I mean, that's, you know, I would start with looking at your product from that perspective. Like how can we empower the researcher to automate as much as possible in terms of all that stuff that he or she has to do anyways, right? With, uh, and I, I know that people spend a lot of time, sometimes very fruitful to spend time on, on the research and, you know, do 
all that um, step by step. But in most of cases, when you are just uh, in a discovery mode, right, you want to check a couple of things and, and you want to look at the existing papers, existing evidence out there, you don't always have time to, you know, check multiple things. So it just, it's a matter of time and resources. So if you can just kind of like uh, have a tool that will empower you to, uh, to get certain uh, structured and well-organized, uh, let's say pieces of research, like a proxy to your uh, literature review, for example, uh, that might be something, you know, interesting. And that just, that's a very raw idea. I mean, of course, it, it can change multiple times, but uh, is this something where you guys thinking to move to, or I'm totally I've got, off? I've got uh, the exactly same feedback from a few researchers. Mm -hmm. They not only underlined this problem, they also underlined um, another problem. For example, um, if you want to search, like if you, uh, in your research, you touch another area, uh, sometimes you have to, because for example, education has some common uh, points with uh, uh, psychiatric uh, researches and some uh, uh, Darwin-like evolution researches, they are all uh, interrelated. So if you want to find the literature, you suddenly have to become an expert in a field you've never touched before. And it's super hard to find a literature and evaluate how reliable the literature is unless you suddenly start learning new method for a completely another science. So I think that these kind of things, they're very close one to another. And we kind of have like, I kind of have a confirmation, but your general idea is like kind of something that this community is really looking for. Sounds very, very reasonable to me. What so yeah. is going to be something like a smart library, if I understand correctly. It sounds almost like taking something like uh, like the, the Cochrane Library reviews that happen around different medical research, mm -hmm. except instead of that being the people pulling that together, making an yeah. action that's actually able to do that, that functionality. Yeah, the core piece here is the actual input of the observer in, in, in terms of the data, because it's not just having a library, but having, having a librarian in the form that is able to point you to the right place and also explain you what this book is about because you're not able to kind of understand what the book is about just by reading the cover. There is much more between the lines. Mm -hmm. the, the most funny part to me is that we're in a sense going all the way to day one of Corona Y because our first implementation piece, our first like very first design doc, like the motivation section was essentially that like a, I like how Sergey put it on like a proxy for this, just like kind of background research, like reading when you do whatever your research analysis is, right? You go to something like a, you're lucky if there was like recently some big conference on the topic, right? You find whatever was like published there and then you do discover research through citation, background research section in those like recent papers, etc. So this is how we started essentially. So at the end of the day, it's already in the DNA of Corona Y. So I think we're, we're just kind of organically kind of getting back and just with all of the experience of this last three weeks or whatever that process went for us. We now think, start thinking about exactly the same thing now with more knowledge and information. Wow. And, and potentially, I mean, I, I think it might uh, kind of like revolutionize the whole peer review process as well, right? Because, you know, when people have these powerful tools, um, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. It's, it's, getting, it's getting somewhere where it needs a lot of kind of like deep thinking. <laughs> where are we getting into? Because it's, it's different research organizations and all these journals. I mean, did you guys check what kind of tools they have? I'm not sure. I'm, I didn't really check like everything yet because I bet there is a lot of different things and maybe some of these companies have certain things like that in pipeline. Did you have a chance to look at like some competitive, uh, potential competitive products yet or? And it, uh, from my understanding, it's so fragmented and so niche uh, tuned in 
that it's almost impossible to use because of you know that aspect of commercial aspect of it. So to give you an example, I had a call with the CEO of Dr. Evidence, which is a company that is doing the search engine for medical purposes. And they're selling this as a subscription to like big, big healthcare institutions and companies. And essentially they're charging like millions of dollars for this, these subscriptions. And the purpose is very, you know, fine tuned. Like you can uh, go deep into like drugs and basically explore certain relationships and concepts, but it's very, very fragmented and it's applied only to that specific customer of theirs. Yeah. And I can also give you kind of like, it's a side, side venue completely, but just, you know, to kind of give you something fresh, uh, some fresh flavor. Like I work in pharmaceutical consulting, for example. So what we do, we have a lot of uh, data, which is, you know, very not, not, not accessible. It's very private and nobody will ever have access to it unless they pay, as you say, million, millions of dollars. But uh, the thing is, um, sometimes when, we, when you're doing some research for your customers, uh, and that can be something like patient journey analysis, for example, you are helping a pharma company to understand um, how their drug is kind of like, what happens to their drug in real life? How patients, um, why they switch from one drug to another? Uh, what is the actual journey of that patient uh, when, when he enters the healthcare system and uh, at, at the exit uh, you know, point? So, and, and sometimes with, with this kind of research, you also want to be able to um, validate your findings with some, what we call real world data of other types like epidemiology data and uh, whatever is available out there, some kind of like papers, uh, published open source and whatnot. So, uh, and if this product would be able to also do that for all the consulting and pharma companies uh, in the world that actually needs this, need this validation. And I'm not sure if they will be always happy to see the results of the validation, <laughs> but you know, the clients would certainly be you know, I, I guess in some instances, very happy. So, um, I mean, that's just a side venue. And, and then I, if, you, if you really start thinking about this, it can get very far, but let, let's probably start, you know, from, from where you guys, you know, from, from the small steps where you are uh, thinking this to move forward now. And uh, yeah, me, essentially, I help you. <laughs> in terms of the big vision, obviously for all of this to properly function, there are kind of three conceptual pieces, right? The underlying infrastructure in terms of this knowledge synthesis and retrieval, but it can work without the actual human input, which is the experts and, you know, annotators or something, and the actual existence of this open data or data that can be easily integrated, which is a problem it was a problem nobody cared about open data before but now suddenly everyone is aware that that's the only way to go forward and companies like biogen which just announced that they're going to open up the um the biobank of blood samples of their employees uh because like uh, they had this big conference and everyone got uh, covid19 as a result and they're opening up that data set for public benefit there will be more and more parties that will realize that that's the only way to, to proceed. So again, big, big vision stuff. There's lots of stuff to discuss, but yeah, let's, let's get on the ground and figure out what we can do by June realistically. And we've created that user stories document. Alex was able to pull that together just to try and figure out what are these like minimum viable stories that, that we can produce. So maybe we can start there. Sure. Uh, does anybody want to share the screen so we can kind of like walk through this or do you want to just discuss this uh, in different way? I think we can start with Alex kind of driving uh, that discussion. Yeah, I can, I can talk about it. Um, so, but the main use case here really is, well, not use case, but what we want to use this for is just to know better what are the needs that this product should fulfill really like we just spoke about. So uh, great to sharing the screen. Um, so and one way to do this in, in the agile world is basically to write down user stories, which is just a sentence as, as this template uh, put down. 
So you have a persona and then this persona wants to achieve a goal um, through some kind of means. Um, that's how you put it down. Um, and then I've, all I've done is, so we have basically, we could have two streams. Um, I'm not sure how re relevant this is at this point. We could have an internal one, which is internal to Corona Y. So in, within Corona Y, what, what our stakeholders want to get out of such a tool or I don't know, an array of tools. And then there's external stakeholders, or you might call them customers. And they might also have um, certain things that they want to go get out of a tool like we just described or some other tool. Um, and at this point, we don't know really what this might be, right? So these user stories should guide us to what, towards this. Um, that's one way of doing it. There's also use cases. With use cases, you really just, it's a bit more, um, I guess, involved. You just, you spell out what's the actual use case. So that can be done too. But just getting an understanding from, um, from like experts, like, like you search, what, what are the actual needs like we're just discussing? That's, that's something that we need to, to garner um, and then work off of it because we want to build something that has the biggest impact. So that's, that's just a framework or one framework to, to achieve that. Um, and if you have, if you already have ideas, I mean, you just said a lot to that. Um, and we can, I've taken notes so we can, we can formalize that. But any more input in this is, uh, would be great, really. If you Sorry, like, if you can already s spell it out clearly, like I would like to achieve X as a as an immunologist, for instance, that that would help a lot. Yeah, yeah. I I would probably uh, give you a suggestion. Uh, you know, maybe we can focus on like one persona for now, and mm -hmm. uh, I think this this kind of like this user. Uh, in my opinion, I mean, it should be something like an epidemiologist. Uh, I explain why. Because virologists, uh, immunologists, uh, that's something very uh, specific and scientifically, you know, kind of like hardcore stuff, in my opinion. Uh, so epidemiologists, kind of like, it's, it's, a, it's a simpler role because uh, an epidemiologist might just want to uh, go ahead and publish an article based on existing uh, research pieces just by compiling whatever exists out there uh, and maybe by doing some uh, small data analysis and some you know data set that they have uh, let's say locally on COVID-19 or something. So epidemiologist is basically kind of like the uh, it might be the more most generalized type of consumer of this sort of uh, product. The most black boxy you know inputs outputs right Right, and I think that like at this stage we sh uh, we start like if we figure out the persona, then we have to the next step is to figure out what pieces of information uh, the persona needs in order to realize we mentioned not to read but understand straight away uh, the application. So like which pieces of data and how should we present in order to really save the time and make the tool uh, useful if that makes sense. Yeah, so uh, let me give you, not, not the answer to this question, but kind of like background uh, idea of th this stuff. So let's say you're an epidemiologist. You're, you're trying to, uh, you have some data that you want to do the analysis on and you want to publish some paper. But the thing is, you never know uh, what exactly going to be the final product. So you never know uh, which area you will have to focus on because you have to go ahead and, and do the research and uh, find which papers have been published on a similar topics and whatever, whatever gaps still exist out there, you might be able to fill with your input. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, basically, uh, and it, it also depends on what, what are your skills in data analysis, by the way. So what kind of you know, methods you might apply there, uh, eventually. So I think I, I would need to really think about this, you know, use cases because it's not that trivial as, as, uh, as it looks uh, initially. Uh, yeah. So or, we're not, I don't, think, I don't think we expect to fill this in on this call. It's just yeah. that we need to have people to talk to, really, to just to, to get intelligence on this. Yeah, I think, we're, this yeah I think so, we're pretty good at filling it out right now, actually. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, yeah. we can keep going. <laughs> we will change many times anyways, because it's just a sketch. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, yeah. I think most important uh, for now is, is to, you know, kind of like choose that one persona, for instance, and align that, you know, we agree that this is the one, this is the type of uh, user we want to focus on right now. I think that's, that would be brilliant. If we, if we do that, if we, uh, you know, justify this uh, and agree on that, uh, and later we can actually, you know, prepare all these things with a focused kind of like approach. Uh, what do you think? So epidemiologist yeah. is the type of researcher we want to focus on for now? Yeah, I think that sure. makes, that, that makes yeah. sense, right. Does, does, does it, I mean, do we know this? Is it, it's actually a question to you, Serge, I think. At least I wouldn't be able it's, to comment. It on sounds what, like that's the easiest okay. one to uh, focus on because of the number of variables that come into place in terms of things that we can uh, influence. Because basically, what, from what I understand from what Serge described, there's a limitless uh, or a limited number of data points that researcher operates here and we ha have yet to define those and there is a limited amount of outputs like types of outputs that that epidemiologists uh, operate right it's not about saving the lives or going to the hospital or working with hospitals or doing something it's really about synthesizing the information based on the incoming data right Serge? that's right uh, it just I, I think epidemiologist gives you a wider range of potential things it might be something very simple, like I might just want to go ahead and, and do some kind of like a literature review and publish it. And that's going to be my kind of like piece of research, which I do as an epidemiologist. And that's going to be, you know, viable research product. Or I might be an epi guy somewhere at Johns Hopkins running real research and collecting data and working with people in labs and, you know, and doing some very sophisticated analytics on that and then and publish that. So, uh, it just gives you a wide range of different things that this can be. Uh, so that's why we can start with some more, more simplistic, you know, use cases for this persona and then move ahead and develop it into like, maybe it's maybe like cover every uh, potential, uh, potential aspect. Let's say, what if, what if you're a researcher, let's call it researcher, not epidemiologist, because, you know, it's kind of like limiting the whole idea. Maybe mm. it's going to be beyond. Mm. Uh, so, what if you, as a researcher, uh, let's say, let me actually pull up the, you know, the camera. I, I can draw. I have the whiteboard here, and I mean, kind of like. Uh, nice. I need that. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Let's say this is like. Can you see, guys? Um, actually, yep. I think. If you move it. Uh, yeah. It's already yeah. upward. Yeah. Better. Yeah. So. Uh, let's say this is like our platform and uh, we want to find out HIV risk factors. So this is what we kind of like put into our uh, search box or whatever. And then uh, our engine populates not just the list of uh, you know, kind of like papers, but sort of like in some time, maybe in a minute or uh, five minutes or whatever, it generates this kind of like a proxy to what your literature review or your background of the research might look like. It will have, you know, multiple things with citations. And I can explain you why it might work because uh, when you're doing the uh, literature review or background research, you're basically taking pieces of existing research, one or two sentences from, from everywhere, you put citations, and you combine them into some kind of a story. And it's, you, you don't really uh, put too much of your own thoughts in this, uh, in this background vision. Uh, and then, you know, what, what is the next step, uh, you know, hypothetically, you, uh, you are doing this because you have certain data set that you have in mind to, to analyze, right? And then what if you can upload this data set here at this stage somewhere? And, um, and this engine gives you kind of like an idea what type of data analysis you might you know, apply here to, to perform uh, some, uh, you know, some analytics and, and, and do some, some product. 
And maybe maybe you can also specify which types of you know which types of what what your study design is in mind. Let's say you want to do uh, you want to produce like logistic regression uh, model. That's very that's very common type of you know uh, <coughs> for for certain uh, uh, epi research. So. I'm just thinking in this in this lines. What what do you think as as a you know as a potential way of moving? That, is this something where you guys moving like in terms of empowering this researcher guy uh, <laughs> to start with something like this, get this product quickly, and then uh, you know obtain some advice from this machine in terms of what kind of analysis can be done here and what could be the final product. Can, I, can you, I, can yeah, you clarify I think, again what the input is? I didn't catch that. The output would be advice on what analysis you should do or what's the side design, what's the input to it? Data set, right? So from my understanding, it's actually not data set, but the types of relationships and the entities that are uncovered through this literature review. And that's kind of what uh, we've observed through different notebooks. For example, risk factors operate on different types of data than the transmission stuff. Transmission stuff is purely about incubation periods, you know, very quantitative type of uh, analysis and definitely subject to like regression type of uh, problems. But the risk factor stuff is really about clustering and, you know, kind of like visualizations that um, are able to to help researchers connect the dots, right? A search, like, are you following what I'm saying? Um, it, can be, it can be anything, honestly. As I understand, we actually talk about uh, two things here. First, instead of researching the database, you have automatic uh, extraction. This extraction, uh, this uh, extraction is segmented so that you know immediately where, where you want to drill down. And then, because as a researcher, you need only relevant citations, you don't read the, the paper, you just get the citation. And voila, like few weeks of work are compensated in a few clicks. Did I get it correct? Yes? Yeah. yeah I mean, okay, so that's yeah. the idea, yeah. And yeah, so basically, we, that's what we are trying to do. And we kind of nailed the, you know, the manual assembly of that process. We need to automate it further. But I think what Serge is describing is actually the next step of what happens after it, because the most important thing is like epidemiologist is not an expert in clustering, but like, you know, we can simplify the <clears> fact <throat> that, hey, you should probably explore the clustering here because of the patterns of data, because of the types of data and entities and relationships. And I, exactly. yep. And th this is amazing because I wrote this in April 13th, basically the fact that there is a finite list of types of problems that should be uh, kind of suggested to whoever is working on this problem, be it regression, clustering, predictive modeling, anomaly detection, classification, identification. And this is exactly what search would expect from this system to output. I'm not sure we're capable of that at this stage, but that would be amazing. But let me kind of quickly add to this. In my eyes already, I'm starting to see in this picture, our, like our task teams, all of those submissions, they were not exactly part of the product we're building and discovering right now. They're actually those clients as well. So we could definitely get like something, this pieces that we already like did within our teams and you see how to optimize them, et cetera. But in reality, the product itself is exactly what Arthur just showed us. Like that thing was as an input to our task team for some of the task teams, right? But this is essentially what we need to automate for them. So we, we definitely will take some of the functionality from the teams, but the rest is essentially, we don't even need epidemiologists, professional ones at this point to develop a product. We already have our teams to iterate with them quickly. It's just kind of my quick observation and thoughts right now. Well, I feel, I feel I, I, differently, honestly. 
Well, the, like, the current feedback from epidemiologists right now on the call is the only thing that made us realize that we have all these pieces. So I, I agree with Maya that like we need uh, people like Serge to provide this feedback loop to us. Serge, I have a, I have a question. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Solomon. Yeah, so, so uh, I, I was just quiet, just to listen what what actually is required. But from uh, my experience, I think we are talking about different things. So first of all, uh, just to simplify, we need library, right? And this library should be linked by, it's called link data to all data sets. And data sets is basically something that uh, states are publishing, I think. And uh, other thing like, like what uh, Artur just showed is just called a virtual research environment. This is just kind of toolbox with different stuff, with different software tools where you can run analysis and you can get some different results based on your experiment. And uh, this is some input for search actually to, to um, figure out about new insights. So I think at the moment, uh, well, first part NLP is already covered and we, we can create a library, that's good. Second part, uh, structured data is not covered at all because we only have a geo team, which is kind of only part of what structured data is. And uh, we have to think about uh, how actually to link all knowledge extracted from different data flows to the same points, to the same data points. And after to do analysis in virtual research environment. I, I think we're talking about same things, but our different background and professional experience <clears throat> is making it look like it's different things. So we just have well, to accept that. <laughs> let me quickly add up a little bit to this and just clarify my position. I'm essentially on the same boat as Slava is describing, right? We are moving from what we can execute like today, tomorrow, and eventually we'll get to the full solution. So I'm just, my remark earlier was essentially, okay, today we could essentially do all of this and our clients are like this half team. So we take all of the things that we could automate, but at the end of the day, we will move closer to what I know Maya's kind of concerns are, right? We need a full feedback loop because no matter what we do here, right? We will have this process of data in, something out, right? And if we have garbage in, we will have garbage out. So we will need to have a close feedback loop of this um, uh, like supervised learning of some sort of our system of our box we're building, right? Especially so when we operate on assumptions that, you know, NLP part is working good because I can assure you it's not working even to 5% of what good is. Yeah, we need to do everything from scratch. The bird should be scared. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just some insight from the actual, like, you know, in the trenches, NLP mm -hmm. stuff. Like, it's, it's not good. Well, I, I found this helpful in that, in, in thinking about, not even in the technical sense, um, but what I've been interested in is kind of what Serge is talking about is, well, what do the people that are going to be able to have an impact with this data that we're producing and, and the products that we're making, what are they, how are they even going to, like, go about accessing it and and i don't it sounds it sounds like we're we're talking about like a technical solution to that uh but this has been really helpful and hopefully i'm under understanding correctly in that like what they're what we should view at least our packaging and and propagation of this data in terms of is like somebody's coming to the to us to do like a literature review and we should take what we know and say all right which questions do you have um and then be able to like serve them possible answers to that question on a on a on a more client side is that is that the, the problem, solution that we're coming to the problem here is the fact that we've both produced the literature review and suggested a method of doing it and that's basically the dichotomy that we're you know bouncing around because first of all we want the people who are interested in risk factors for covid-19 to look at this and be like oh you know there is something useful because this is the, the valuable uh, literature review for them, hopefully, to some extent. And that's something we can uh, try to, to validate. If yes, that's, that's even further emphasis on the fact that what our methodology is right. But also the second piece is, hey, we 
potentially are creating a tool that will help you answer any question, not just the heart disease risks uh, factors for COVID-19, but asking like, you know, how does the genetic haplogroup affect the COVID-19 something, blah, blah, blah. And those are two different things that we're exploring here. Does it make sense? Yes, it does, to me at least. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it, make, it makes sense to put it in, in terms of those two things, if we're aggregating from the rest of the world or we're just dealing with what we are currently producing and how we can produce that better. Uh, I was thinking in, in the former terms, um, but yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, Serge, I have a question. Um, so let me just kind of run through what sounded like it would be one typical use case of, of the, the bigger picture piece that might be there. Um, so again, you have potentially, a, you mentioned that having a data set. So you might have a data set, you might have a, a line of inquiry that you're looking on doing epidemiologically. And then you put those in, ideally you then are able to get out. Uh, okay, here's, here's the types of analysis that are probably the useful ones to be doing around this. Then have the ability to do like you said, sort of a proxy for that literature review, have sort of a snapshot of what that should look like um, that you can then dive into and do the, the full literature review from there. Um, ideally, I mean, again, looking long-term, if it's talking about the different kinds of analysis that can be done, if it's able to do some of that analysis, that's great. If it's able to do some visualization around that, that's great. Um, is that on track in terms of what you were talking about around a potential workflow? Yeah, and I think you guys are on track as well, because I mean, uh, somebody mentioned this term uh, research toolbox. That's basically, you know, what it is. Uh, it's like some environment where you can actually play with different things and, you know, uh, get some results. So, yeah. Uh, from, from, a, from a sort of a in the trenches, pharmacological, political side, uh, one of my questions is, if something like this would potentially have a high monetary value, is there a chance that um, there would be the ability for the data sets to be a part of that cost? So that data, cost, data sets might be in some way anonymized and shared in a way so that it's adding to the aggregate knowledge um, and that the benefit that the company that's doing that then is, is that they get to get those very focused um, functions out from their toolbox. Or is that something that's just totally impractical? Yeah, to re rephrase that in analogy, what would make Biogen participate in this without having a pandemic? Right. Yeah, like I said, uh, most, of, most of their research, what they do now, um, especially, I mean, not especially, but let's say, I'm just doing a lot of like marketing research. That's my side of the game. So um, most of pharma companies would pay money for validation of the research they're getting from consulting firms, for instance. Because uh, if, you, if you are planning your uh, R&D and your marketing based on certain data and certain results, you want to validate that with some existing uh, epi kind of research results as well. And that's not always possible because you, you have to spend a lot of money to hire another consulting company to do that validation for you, for instance. So um, in this case, we can basically cover that aspect at least. And that's not even that hard to do. In most cases, it's you know very uh, simplistic type of analysis what can be produced for um, for those uh, for those uh, clients. It just if this tool will be able to find you know appropriate materials to work with quickly, that's the whole thing. Appropriate data and appropriate background kind of like picture of whatever is being you know spoken about. And obviously it sounds sim simplistic to you because you're dealing with it on an everyday basis, but maybe it will be helpful for us um, without uh, you disclosing any proprietary information to give kind of the workflow for a typical inquiry that comes your way. Like for example, we want to create a new HIV uh, type of treatment, like, and, and just like step-by-step step what you do as part of the epidemiology consultant or market researchers. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it would be lovely also to understand the type of uh, customer. For example, is it an established corporation mostly? Uh, or, or are they startups? Because their behavior will be slightly different, I assume, no? There are some startups, but mostly it's big pharma as a customer, but uh, yeah, thank you. Um, 
we can we can definitely get to that point where we can uh, describe i can provide you a lot of different uh, good things but the thing is uh, what what my my brain just needs kind of like uh, one one thing to focus on like if we can if uh, if you can please provide me like what is the vision of the product finally because i think you guys have slightly different um you know kind of like uh, approaches to it so we should we should try to align on that because uh i just you know my <laughs> operating system doesn't work uh if i if i don't understand what we are doing like what what's we need the final some structure point? yes that's no, something it, it's structured i mean and you you're all brilliant absolutely it just uh, you know it, it's hard for me to you know sort of like get into this right away and understand where where i should you know kind of like put my efforts because um, what, that's what, why I want to go from the like reverse engineer what you actually do on a daily basis and like if I if I would ask you to describe the 80% kind of like the Pareto of your work like what you do on a typical consulting uh, basis and we can kind of try to reverse engineer that process and supply you with the user stories that we think would help you and that's probably the best way. I agree, but right. I, I don't want to, you to bias you by my stories right now because I want you to first uh, consolidate your vision, what you have right now, with what you've built already, and you know, and then we can get into because if I if I kind of like give you some examples now, that might sound cool, but we don't even know if it's going to be applicable or if it's that what you want, guys, because this is you know very I'm valid concern. I think already working on this. I respect that. You know? The best thing to do here is actually have, you know, tens of people like you provide that biased type of view for us to converge to something that is, I mean, not biased, but like at least tailored to specific personas. I would fully underline that. I think we were starved for input here, actually. We, we need guys like, like you, Serge, that can actually give us the main knowledge. Okay. And then we can, we can discuss it still. And this is an iteration of, of many, right? Like we, we just need to, we chip in our expertise and you chip in yours and then we converge ultimately. And, and it's iterative, so if you tell us like, you know, if you had the magic genie that was able to do the, the pieces that would speed up things for you, then, then we can go back and look at, okay, which of those things are, are feasible and related to what it is that we're working on. And okay. then we're fine. Got it. I'll, I'll, give you a couple, I'll, I'll give you a couple of use cases. One, let's say, um, I, I think we should start working on like one, one use case should be sort of like a public health oriented thing, which is not very much into monetization aspect, but more kind of like open source thing. And another part could be like a, a uh, you know, client serving uh, tool for, for a pharma and consulting firms who are, you know, trying to validate their research with real world data that they work with anyway. So if we, you know, I can provide you those two, for example, cases, and, and then we can start from there and you can evaluate if this makes sense, if this aligns with your vision, with your values, with your ideas, and, you know, we can move from that point, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, the, the magic here is that since this call, it already became your idea too. So that's, that's basically how we work. We just okay. uh, include people into this, the flare here, flare there, and then the fire starts and some structure emerges. So like, t just tell us what's the best way for, for that. Like if you can uh, kind of outline those two use cases in under five minutes, we can try to go through those now. Um, is that possible or that's too much? I don't think that's going, I mean, we can try to do that like in a very uh, uh, broad High level. Let, let's yeah. try it. We can do that. Let's <laughs> try it, yeah. Okay, so let's start with, like I said, with epidemiologist, uh, this type of like public health research person. Uh, and why I actually draw that thing, because uh, I, I think uh, we should accept the reality, you know, that every researcher is not a machine. Like we are, people are far from being perfect in terms of how they do their research. And I can tell you, um, I learned this hard way because like when, when you have to work with uh, your uh, advisors on your thesis or whatever dissertations and stuff like that it's a process which takes millions of uh, you know hours of your life and everything what i'm trying to say is that at every possible step we can empower this person to get better insights with this research toolbox 
like if we can help uh, that person to quickly generate the proxy to this background so person can read that and understand where his or her vision fits into this you know existing uh, existing material uh, and picture and then at the step of like data analysis this toolbox as you mentioned great term um, it can advise this person on different types of analysis that can be done with existing data or maybe it can even suggest what kind of data is needed here because you know what if what, what if i don't even have any data what if i just i just want to you know find out what i can do and then based on what i can do i can then go ahead and find some data from open source or whatever um, so this is like very briefly one use case another use case let's say you're working for uh, pharma and consulting firms so like i said let's say uh you know some pharma company is doing the research marketing research of their drugs uh, in multiple aspects and and they are hiring uh, different consulting firms there are 25 30 50 different consulting firms that are working for pharma and they harvesting a lot of money for for what they do you know uh, and and usually they work with proprietary data like um, insurance claims um, all kind of prescription data uh, EHR uh, health records also that's not accessible data that's very you know sec secured uh, and expensive data uh, but they they producing some um, research products and they basically provide it to their clients to pharma companies so what if we can uh, actually uh, go ahead and work uh, either for pharma company or for this same uh, consulting firm and help them validate that research with other types of data existing in the world like um, when when you are let me give an example I, I just I try to be careful with not to disclose something at the same time to give you some you know tangible example maybe I can ask you for, uh, for potential uh, you know application of, of this because uh, I I used to uh, help the, um, one of the startups which was determined to fix the opioid abuse uh, in US. And there was a, a major concern with the same thing, like just understanding the patterns of the drug abuse, the doctor shopping and all of these things that are out there, uh, very enclosed in these government, um, you know, state by state uh, PM, DMP type of systems. And how would you approach that if you would have this magic genie? That's too complex. Arthur. <laughs> okay. I mean, just, it doesn't, this kind of use, you know, this kind of stuff usually doesn't really work, honestly. But let me give you like example, which I actually done myself. And this was not related to my current job, so I can disclose it. So at one point of time, was maybe a couple of years ago, uh, one friend who is working for a pharma company, he asked me to help him uh, to produce this real world type of analysis to kind of like back up whatever they were doing there. And I was, as a private consultant doing that for, for them. So, uh, and they, these guys, they are like in acne, you know, acne, that's like the disease. So acne area. So um, they have produced certain research and they wanted me to help them to kind of like put together uh, a little paper, a small paper with some graphs and everything, which explains what is like the demographics, what is the geographical, uh, you know, spread what is the prevalence what is the incidence of acne in the us so i just you know basically i i, I went ahead I, I found some data sets and i uh, combined whatever i could have found and just gave them you know a very detailed as much as it could have been done in that perspective a uh, picture of all possible you know segments of uh, people who are affected by acne and that was coming not from uh, you know, DX or RX kind of data, you know, not proprietary, but open source stuff. And it was, you know, it was five pages or something, but it was beautiful and it worked it helped to, uh, you know, it helped them to uh, accumulate their efforts in terms of the marketing effort. They, were, they knew where they should spend their efforts, which segment, because they also went to consulting firm that is working with proprietary data and they, you know, they did the same kind of research, but on a different level. And then my piece of it was just to validate the findings, you know? Amazing. So, that so that, that, that sounds that, like a perfect use case. 
that's a, yeah, and that's very simple, right? So, uh, and and honestly, uh, like I'm sure that if if we come up with something like that, <laughs> people will pay money for this. Like pharma companies, they you know they have no choice. They 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 are in such situation when they actually have to spend a lot of money to validate their findings because uh, you know back in the days they had too much money. Like people say that they had too much money, right? Now uh, the budgets and everything is just, it's getting more and more tight. So they are trying to, to you know, use as much as possible of different sophisticated data science tools to maximize you know, the ROI on every effort that they do. So this sort of thing can be actually helpful. I'm pretty sure about that. So, uh, and we can, we can also kind of like get into details with this stuff, but I'm, I just want yeah. to make sure that you guys are that this is what you know what do you guys think i i think this these two things are very in line with what we've created our imagining and basically this discovery engine like that that's it yeah i mean well, the yeah at least for the first use case i can definitely see how we can um kind of realize it in terms of you know with, re with respect to a topic of interest, we can definitely get a summary of those topics and suggest like where's the gap, what's a question you can ask from based on the summary, and what's the analysis or studies that you can do for this question. Uh, that's just my take for the first one. And that's where I would start. This is, this yeah. is where we should definitely start. I mean, all the other stuff, uh, you know, money and then, you know, Proprietary products that that's probably should be somewhere probably in the pipeline. Let me ask you at this stage of exploration for acne uh, type of use case, how much have you actually produced new types of data based on these uh, open data sets or you've basically applied existing toolbox or methods to explore uh, the public data sets. Have you enriched it or pre processed it in any way. I haven't done that I, uh, I didn't have that complex uh, type of research question. I only had to basically provide, you know, the uh, more or less basic prevalence type data. But uh, how often do you do that on more yeah, complex uh, scenarios? It, they exist for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. so the, the applicability of this has the range from zero level complexity to 100. So, yeah. It just it depends on different cases. Okay. Yeah, in a perfect world, it's probably a report generating tool. Like you press the button and it's done. Like that would have been amazing. But then uh, uh, you need to understand possible scenarios. I'm sure that possible scenarios are actually limited. Um, possible scenarios? Yeah, for research. Yeah, and, you know, it's not a it's not a problem. And if they are limited, that's even good. I I would not spend time to kind of like I would not waste time on something which is not even applicable. You know, if 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 this is if I if I uh, end up with having several choices, only several choice of research uh, design that can be applied, that's good for me. Uh, it, it saves my time, right? If I get what you what you mean correctly in this case. Uh what I what I was referring to, it's like, for example, we are now on a very beginning stage where we just try to understand, segment, and properly extract data. But probably the final like kind, of, you know, too, where instead of guys who sit hard, uh, browse open sources and then generate some reports, we can gen we can just do the final step, the report generation. So you want to understand, like for example, marketing effort. Acne, okay? For example, scenario. What you get areas, uh, age of population, what they use in that area, etc. Because like normally researchers are, are kind of, you know, structure it in, 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 in a more or less similar way. So you kind of like, if you know this uh, research design and types of research like design, the questions that the pharma companies ask, then in a perfect world, like which is very very far from now. I'm speaking about something that might will happen like in a few years. 
from now that like you you generate the full report that answers uh, most of the questions which is i think kind of you know possible at the end yeah so basically what maya is referring is the variability of use cases and types of data that is being operated for various uh you know niches industries and things like that right i'm claiming that it's limited let me ask you a question. Did you, uh, in, in the process of, you know, for production of this, uh, your, your current products, did you did you look at the uh, tools like Tableau, uh, Alteryx? I mean, I'm just asking because I don't know. Maybe maybe they're doing something similarish already. No, I mean, that's the report generating tools actually in some in some way. Data visualization. Yes, they don't answer. They like help you. Like mm -hmm. first of all, you should understand the data you look at. Second, uh, you should know how to manipulate the data. They, like, Tableau is okay too. Uh, it takes time to get used to it, but I don't mean that. I mean, like, a smart system that processes your requests and kind of generates your final report. Right. But think about this. Why big companies like Tableau and Alteryx or whatever, uh, data robot, they, many of them. Why did not they come up with something like that already? I mean, we just have to be kind of like cautious in these terms. Maybe we are thinking too big already, you know. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. And then, by the way, uh, all this stuff gave me thinking that, I mean, I have seen some very um, advanced small pharmaceutical consulting firms uh, that uh, exist out there and they are, they look like they are working on something you know, very sophisticated. Because I work for the largest pharma consulting firm. We don't have to be that, you know, fancy. Uh, we, you know, that's just the way it works. But smaller firms, they have to be as fancy as possible. They, they produce something uh, phenomenal. Uh, and they might have something like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that some of them have something like that already. I, I mean, this tools that help to validate uh, real world data or something, um, I would have to check that. And I, uh, I might, you know, in, invite one of my friends. I have to ask him if he is, you know, he would be willing to work with us. Uh, uh, he is working, he's in London and uh, he's working for one of the biggest pharma companies as a director of analytics. And uh, I mean, he has uh, very bright ideas about potential use of uh, data in, in marketing research. This, I mean, not related to COVID-19. I just, I, I had a chance to speak to him before. And uh, um, yeah, we, you know, if, if we want to go that route, I mean, pharma, it just, uh, I don't want to bias you guys. I'm just like all in this stuff and in, in pharmaceuticals and everything, but it might be not actually what you need in this, at this level, because it, it might become like, uh, you know, we might be like an Alice, uh, in the wonderland and it, it, it might never, this, uh, this, this, uh, this rabbit hole might never end if we just, uh, look into it, you know? So, um, but I want to I want to hear some of your feedback. I mean, eventually, like w w where do you want to like focus on your efforts? Uh, I think in any input of, oh. is actually is actually a good input at this stage. So whatever you can, if you can, for instance, tap right. into the competition because you just mentioned that, right? You might be able to go back and check against co the competition or being a friend on board. At this stage, this is all really valuable. Um, yeah, yeah. And then we can narrow it down, actually. Yeah, great stuff. I just want to make sure that I check the right type of competition. I, I don't want to, you know, give you mm -hmm. some, again, biased vision of, of this stuff. Well, I, I think for the real world data, like a validation case, it might be, we might be able to generalize it a little bit because for, from our data set, we're also trying to synthesize some um, evidence with respect to some research questions. And we can also try to validate what we find using the real world data. And in this model, it would be applicable to other scenarios. I think like for example, the specific scenario you're referring to. Yep, yeah. Like we're basically just combining different data sources, like comparing them. Um, so I think that's actually generalizable to our different scenarios. It's totally doable, uh, you know, real world data, kind of like a validation tool, that's right. for sure doable. I'm just, I'm just like a little bit afraid that once we step in that realm of, uh, you know, pharmaceutical business, let's say, 
uh, then it becomes a different type of a project right away. And if you want that to actually right. work, it has, to, I mean, it, it has to be a full uh, empowered functioning uh, consulting firm at that level, you know, with all the bells and whistles, with all the uh, security aspects and blah, 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 blah. So, I mean. Yeah, and your concern is very valid to give you kind of idea how we are thinking about dealing with that level of complexity. We're treating ourselves as a launchpad organization that basically has an exciting idea. Let's say you come to us and you're like, I want to build the next level consulting firm for pharmacology industry, but I have no clue how to deal with AI machine learning, or I have no supplies or funding to build it, or I don't have people and things like that. And we basically tell you, okay, we have all of that. We can help you build this rocket and then uh, help you launch it into the space and basically help you equip it with all the payload that, that you need. So we're treating it as a, uh, actually a good thing that we have a very well formalized type of scenarios. It's a little bit different than, you know, approaching it from the startup world where you, we have to be like very cautious what problem we're solving because we're potentially, we have unlimited pool of people, unlimited pool of engineers, volunteers, and potentially funding too through the various um, organizations or nonprofits or even commercial organizations. So as long as we have a well-defined, formalized idea, the key stakeholders and intent to, you know, the fact that this idea is valid, I think it's, it's okay for us to spin off these separate rockets and just launch it to the space and build this kind of the ground, groundwork and foundation to supply the teams with it. Because again, there might be a, pharmaco a pharmacology uh, aspect to it, but hey, there might be just pure government policy aspect of it that will still use the same tools and foundation, but will have very different goals, very different processes, SOPs, compliance, and other things. Does it make I'm sense? I'm concerned about this vision because um, I, I don't think, I mean, at least that's not, look, I also come from a startup world. I know how startup world works and everything, and incubators and all that stuff. But uh, in, in pharmaceuticals, this is not going to fly just because uh, people who launch, uh, uh, let's say, uh, pharma consulting companies, as you mentioned, they have to be coming from the industry. They, they can't just launch it because they want to do that. I mean, it, it usually never happens. <laughs> like, it probably never happens. So, um, I, so why do you want to help others to launch something like that? Why don't you want to do it yourself? I mean, that because you have to do it yourself at least once uh, correctly to be able to teach someone else. I mean, how, what's your, like, like what's your credibility in this? Why would I go to you and uh, why would you be helping me to launch a pharma and, consultant? And here's what I meant by this idea becoming yours, because we're the least people to, to build this uh, type of product or type of uh, infrastructure. We need people that come from the industry and have credentials and have the networks and have potentially understanding what has to be built. So I would rephrase that, like we don't really want to create a, a pharma type of product. We want to empower people like you and many others to create these. Got it. Yeah, all right, I, I mean, I got it. Just, it's still, I'm sorry. It, it, it's, it's hard. A lot it's, of different things. I, I, I just, uh, you know, I can't, uh, I also have been a part of startups multiple times, honestly, and uh, this is the way it kind of starts and people have multiple ideas. And, uh, you know, what I, what I call it, it's like, you don't want to build a Titanic, you know, it might be a large ship and nice, but we don't want it to sink like in the first uh, time and being in the ocean. So, um, yeah, like I, I will provide you what you asked. Uh, and uh, I also probably want to hear some, uh, like maybe, maybe you can guys somehow align on some vision, what you want to do. I mean, if that's possible, because I think like what I heard here, each of, the, each of you like bring into the table, something fantastic. Like I, I, I cannot say that it's, you know, that it's not, not, uh, interesting or not, uh, applicable. I'm just not sure. Like if you are at the same page, I have a feeling that you're not at the same page, you know, maybe. Maybe because I just don't. 100%. We're not. 
like that's that's the reality we're trying to converge to that and it's a big problem because we come from such different backgrounds and professional experiences and everyone is biased by different things and like we are working to create a process and structure to help that i'm not sure we're there yet but your your observation is on point and i think I, part, part of it's just where our trajectory is you know we've had these four tasks that have been the focus for the time up until now and i think now we're starting in on the next step of what's going to be kind of a darwinian approach where we we try a bunch of different little things out we see which things have traction which things are viable and useful to people um we'll have some ideas that are total disasters but the idea is to figure out how we measure that accurately enough to drop them and then we can keep so it's, it's, it's this divergence convergence sort of pulse that's going on one of the from my perspective for example one of the amazingness of uh, corona why is that uh, unlike in any other organization first of all you get fast delivery, despite that you have even one, you don't have even one paid worker. Like just go through a notebook and look what people done within two weeks, having yeah. no team. Like think about it. Yeah. We have an access to 800, starting from top professionals, uh, company owners, industry leaders, and up to like, you know, talented students. You have a huge, enormous, uh, the base of a highly qualified workforce, yep. which is kind of, you know, um, not self-evident. And beside that, um, we hear kind of brainstorming and work together and kind of everyone brings his own experience in order to build something that is doable, maybe um, for sure imp impactful, it's very important and probably monetized. So it's, it's kind of, you know, so you, you like, I understand, I perfectly understand your concern because like there are many uh, kind of uh, things that can bother. For example, what if I waste my time? It's kind of scary. Uh, what if I don't go live with these guys? Like, what if, like, what I mean is not really acceptable here? Will it work? Will not it work? Well, if, like, and I understand that everybody who actually comes from a stronger organizational, with a strong organizational background, they expect some strict structure to be applied and kind of things to be clear. But that's not exactly the case. And that's a disadvantage. No questions from one side. But that's a huge advantage and huge opportunities from another side. So just, you know, I would have said kind of, for now, just like, it's my own opinion, right? I, I don't represent like everybody. I'm, I'm speaking from my own kind of feelings. Uh, like just kind of, you know, relax, let it kind of settle. And suddenly in a couple of days from now, you're, oh guys, okay, I know, here we are, let's go. You kind of give us a push. And while in a week you have kind of, you know, product on your hands and you're like, wow, what? So just kind of, yeah. you know, a little yeah. bit go with the flow. But, you, but you, you're like, we are very close to the point where we need to start actually building a product. Like, you know, that this, I, I think, I think this timeline when this was possible, I think that's, or should be in the past. I mean, or close to the point, you know? Like we should start to focus like on something very specific and uh, you know as much as possible in this case. But I hear you. It's this creative environment. It's fabulous because you when you let people think, when you actually allow them, allow yourself to think, it's 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 amazing. It's like it's not what you can see in corporations, of course. Corporations don't work like that, and that's why they are slow, and that's why they you know <laughs> we know Absolutely. all that. Yeah. Yeah, so, so. Yeah, so, so just kind of, you know, bear with us, give it a little thought, and kind of when you f like feel like we might participate in a few more brainstormings, we might bring a few more professionals, and suddenly, you know, heuristically, like kind of this general brainstorming suddenly gives you a solid approach that you can go with and, and do amazing things. Yep. 
in talking with one 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 person today as well um or yesterday the the conversation in part was if you if, if we get a little thing if you throw something at us to kind of say like it seems like you guys are crazy and scattered and don't know what the hell you're doing um then you throw something at us and 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 we'll see what we can do in terms of how this self organizes around that piece so that we can give you something back because that's important validation to have we're a really weird model um but th th that's the kind of validation that we welcome and encourage so somebody's saying like maybe this is the kind of a thing that you can do and then and then a week or two later we can come back and either say like here's what we've made or say like yeah no we totally can't do that and either way that's useful to us okay yep all right all right yeah. i think we're we're good we've accomplished a lot i also i'll read the comment of sean which uh brought a very good point that the initial kaggle competition questions tasks are a good starting point for this discovery engine and we just we just have to build around them and build something generalized to support for these and in in mind uh, we have to create something that can expand to any question. So let's say June deadline comes in, we have a product that fits all of these questions and opens up a discussion for potential new questions that the engine, discovery engine can open Let me up. Let give my feedback on this, Arthur, and everybody. Um, when I saw those questions from White House and this Kaggle uh, competition, I was very much surprised. I feel like they just, I mean, Yes, but potentially we can help them to solve this problem, to help to answer this question. Help them future. frame proper questions. Uh, but the thing is, uh, what is our goal in this case? Like, yes, they might shoot another like uh, short TV uh, something interview with you, Arthur, you know, whatever about this <laughs> afterwards. And that's going to be it because uh, I'm just going to tell you that um, we are, you know, the researchers who are working on this uh, question right now, this issue, the COVID-19, I mean, they will do whatever that has to be done, no matter what. And, 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 uh, and the, we're not going to impact that process too much. And the other thing is, because it's such a new issue, we, um, we don't want to put this project at risk of producing something invalid and not cool. Because there is, there is no way to kind of like, if I want to look at HIV, let's say, you know, mm -hmm. which is investigated million times around the world, I can at least validate that my tool is working because I can, you know, actually check. Uh, in this case, those questions are too broad. What are the risk factors of COVID-19? Eventually, we're all going to have several articles on PubMed published by some brilliant people from Johns Hopkins, where there's going to be one abstract you know, and there's going to be all those things listed in, you know, a couple of uh, sentences or maybe like one paper, for instance. But and that's what people are going to rely on. They're not going to rely on something like some, you know, even tool like Coronavi, because in the research world, people are still going to be willing to see the research papers like some some final product of some so let work. me ask you and obviously the, that interview and i try to make sure that it's uh, understood that we're not creating the insights we're not publishing papers we're right. creating that tool for researchers of john hopkins rockefeller university and others to actually maybe find something useful and valid to some extent or see something invalid and maybe that brings the, the validness to, to their research or something like that. So don't you think that's, that's a, a good angle to explore by June? Like I said, potentially, yes. But, uh, if, if, we can, if we can produce some impact on the research community, yes. I'm just not sure how we can measure that, you know? Yeah. Because um, it, it just, <laughs> like, like I'm saying, you know, people will eventually, people who are seriously working on this question, they will get their information no matter what, with coronavirus or without it. So even if they will use this tool, you need to be able to take some credit for it, right, eventually, to, to build something. I mean, I don't know. That's the way I would think about this, because uh, those questions are very broad. And let's say when it gets to ph pharma, pharmacology and, you know, pharmaceutical aspect of it, you know, it's people are working on this stuff. Trust me, like the best researchers in those pharma companies who are now uh, trying to build some new new medicines for for this stuff and even vaccines or whatever so um 
but at the same time, those are good questions. I mean, what can I say? It, it's okay. It, it's okay to work on that because it at least kind of like uh, gives us some focus, you know, some some agenda. Um, just be mindful that you might not be able to see the real impact of this eventually. Yeah. You know, like, and that's okay, I think. I think it seems like the best thing we're trying to do is, is find the critical path in terms of what are the things where we can, if we can shorten a little bit of time here and a little bit of time there in terms of the useful things that the actual researchers are doing, that's a, and, and so right now all we're doing is trying to identify which are the segments of that critical path that we can impact and we don't care as much about the other pieces. We're just looking at what are the things we can do to get, to get something better happening on the ground. Got it. That makes sense. That, that's a very solid idea. All right. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everyone, for jumping in today. I Thanks. think we're going to have a couple of uh, sessions to figure out at least a draft of user stories based on your feedback search. And we highly encourage you to join Slack conversations as, as overwhelming as, as they are. There's some good stuff happening there. I, I was and, very busy last week. Now I'm going to you know, be more involved, so for sure. Yep. Oh, lovely. Perfect. Very Sounds good. good. And again, to, uh, to wrap it up, if you feel that there are some relevant people that can be beneficial to this, just point them our way and let's see what happens. I will. I just don't want to overwhelm you. You know, sometimes more people means more ideas and that might be even harmful. You know, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. There is a balance to it. I fully agree. But so far, the more stuff comes in, like it self organizes the focus, like it, it just happens, it emerges by itself. There is no explanation. Don't be biased by this, this is just your impression. Because like I said, because we are at this stage of this like embryo, that's when this is still cool. But when you when we actually would have to produce some final, you know, very tangible product, that's when this becomes, you know, yeah. an opposite effect. <laughs> yeah, I agree. All right. Actually, All right. Yeah, they uh, Conde, you know, a researcher approach, uh, up to certain degree, skepticism, uh, kind of very, very solid reasonability, right? Being very reasonable and very, very down to earth is extremely um, enriching. Yeah. Because it kind of gives you focus and it kind of, you know, gives you an actual real life feedback. And that's one of the amazing thing you can actually bring uh, to our cooperation because we actually, as I feel again, yeah, we lock it. So like really, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, working more with you. That's, that's just feels amazing. Thank you, Maya. Yeah, likewise. I mean, we will definitely go ahead together and do some, produce some very good results. I, I, I believe in that for sure. Right. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank right. you. Thank, Thank you, Serge. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.